Matthew Vaughn's Argyle is one of the most talked about films of the year so far, right up there with Dune Part 2. But unlike Dune, the Argyle discourse is nowhere near as well regarded. When it first hit streaming, Argyle became even more of a topic of conversation, as the people who had heard about it but didn't want to see it in theaters got their hands on it and could share clips on social media. So now that that is mostly over, I'm finally going to talk about it. <sighs> I should have made this faster. Making films is hard, and I in no way think of myself as smarter than the people who do it professionally. All I want to do here is take my criticisms and turn them into a hopefully entertaining thought experiment on what might have been. Let's do this. Okay, internet, if you are less familiar with Argyle Beyond the Memes, or just need a refresher, I'll try to summarize it as quick as I can. <clears throat> We're introduced to Ellie Conway, played by Bryce Dallas Howard, who is a writer famous for her spy series Argyle, who's personified in the scenes recreating elements of the book by Henry Cavill. These novels have connections to and have predicted real-world events. We get glimpses of her quiet life with her cat, her relationship with her mother, and her writing process. On a train ride to meet her family, Ellie meets Sam Rockwell's Aiden, who is revealed to be a real-life spy, defending her from an assassination attempt. A lot of blink-based transitions here. The Division, a real-life spy organization, is after Ellie because her books are predictive, including her current manuscript that parallels current events. A series of spy action, globetrotting stuff goes on, while Ellie starts not only seeing Argyle in Aiden's action sequences, but in herself, even talking to him at one point. She runs from Aiden, thinking he's on a killer, she meets up with her parents, finding out that her dad is the head of Division, and that they are both evil spies out together. More spy stuff, Sam Jackson is former CIA, and Ellie finds out that the real Agent Argyle was inside of her the whole time. She was brainwashed. And honestly, the bones here aren't bad. In fact, I think a lot of this movie is pretty solid, and even like the jokes I feel land more than I expected them to. I walked into this thinking that it was going to be a shit show, but in reality, it's just kind of messy. Like, we have both of those twists at the midway point, and then there's almost another hour of the film. So I want to break them up a little. Make one of them the midpoint reveal, and one of them a third act twist. But what is the difference between them? The midpoint reveal obviously happens in the middle. It serves the purpose of a shocker moment that is meant to recontextualize what has happened so far. The garden party in Get Out is a prime example as it shows the audience that this isn't just a movie about Chris's paranoia, but that there is something darker going on under the surface. The third act twist comes later and is tied to the all is lost moment. A character is at their lowest, but after a shocking reveal, the tides can turn, either for better or worse. This is different than a twist ending, where the whole plot is turned on its head in the 11th hour. Seven features both of these. John Doe reveals himself to the police, with the detectives no longer trying to figure out the next step, and knowing that they are on the right path. The twist ending is the box scene. The detectives discover that this was all part of the plan, John Doe making himself envy, turning Mills into wrath, completing the sins motif. Seven ties these two twists together, but a film can obviously do one or the other if they want. Writing rules are guidelines at the end of the day. The code is more what you're called guidelines than actual rules. So we need to ask what will be in the midpoint and what will be in the third act. I think if we keep them in the same order, the parent reveal, then that she is Argyle, with more space between them, it would feel off. Too much time between them would feel like we're dragging things out, so let's switch them around. We can have Aiden reveal the truth to her in an emotional outburst. He's mad that she can't keep up with him. She can't act like the field agent that she was before, and as we'll find out later, she doesn't love him now. Having this happen after the boat escape makes sense to me, and can replace the bit where Ellie overhears Aiden on the phone, thinking that she is, you know, in danger with him, because that bit where she can't trust him doesn't feel like a good beat to me. So from there, they would go to France, and Aiden would try to train her to be a spy again, leading to further complications. This would be less of a push to the plot, and more of a quieter moment to deepen the characters. Every glimpse we get at Rachel Kyle, we get a larger moment of Ellie failing. One step forward, two steps back. Eventually, we get a division raid on the villa, where Ellie cannot defend herself, they get separated, the all is lost moment. 
the all is lost moment. This is where she runs to her family and gives us the second twist. So with those worked out, we can lay out the rest of the three act structure. Now reminder, when actually writing a script, you shouldn't be trying to hit every beat of the structure. That would lead to an extremely formulaic script. This is a guideline. guideline. You should know the structure so that way you can internalize the flow of compelling stories and know how to break structure. That said, plotting out like this will be a way for us to chart the similarities and changes made within this rewrite. Education. All right, so for this, I'm going to be discussing specifically this version of the three act structure on screen now. There's tons of versions with slight differences online, so I want to make sure we're on the same page here. Actually, Here we go. There. The beginning, inciting incident, and second thoughts, really all of act one can stay more or less the same. The climax being the train sequence. The one thing I would honestly change in all of this is making the division agent Carlos more of a threat. He needs to be like a cool Bond style villain or the Bladefoot woman Sofia Butella plays in Kingsman. I want to set him up as an expert brawler, show it off a little here, but more importantly, show a glimmer of fear in Sam Rockwell's character when he walks in. Carlos has got to matter more. Leading to the midway, there's two obstacles. The first, going to London to find the hacker's apartment and get the master key. The second is getting there and fighting more division people. The major change here is that they don't find a code they need to break to find the location of the master key. They find the master key directly. We need to streamline some stuff here. And like I said earlier, the midpoint is Rockwell blowing up on Ellie. The obstacle, <laughs> the obstacle is that the training doesn't go well. Disaster. Raid on Sam Jackson's safe house. My boy Carlos rolls in and really messes them up. Ellie gets away, not sure if the Sams, Rockwell and Jackson, are alive or not. Now she's stranded in France alone. The climax of Act 2 heading into Act 3, that's our third act twist. Yeah, I know, technically it's Act 2, but Act 3, same, it's going into Act 3. I know. The parent twist, Rockwell saves her, and now the Division has the master key. With the climax being, her regaining her skills and doing the smoke fight and finally beating Carlos. The last obstacle being getting Brian Cranston's eye to get the master key back. No more double agent, no more mind control music box, no more Kira returning to save them. With Kira in specific, I found that the exposition is so ham-fisted and I think all the stuff I'm cutting here could be a whole well-paced sequel movie on its own. So I'm leaving the setup elements for that in. So that way, that can be the follow-up, because it's so rushed at the end. Lastly, the final scene at the reading, the wrap-up, we're not going to have that weird Henry Cavill bit. Instead, we have Catherine O'Hara watching from outside, putting on sunglasses to cover her new Blofeld-esque scars, letting us know that there is more to come. Oh, and no Kingsman post credit scene. Or put it in, I don't care. I didn't like it, but... It doesn't really matter to me. But we have one more thing to discuss, and that is some of the stylistic elements of the film. Vaughn has been building on his brand of action more and more since Kingsman, and it's on full display here. I gotta admit, I kind of love that brightly colored dance fight in the final act. Dancing is set up throughout the film, and I think we can build up to it more. If we specify early on that the action in the novel sections are that sleek, over-stylized stuff, and then contradict the visual language by having Sam Rockwell's real-life fight sequences being grittier and more realistically shot, then the fight style can become more and more impactful as it combines the fiction style with reality, representing Rachel regaining that side of herself. And then the following brawl with Carlos will still be sleek, but have brought it back down closer to reality, making the gas fight its flashy peak. A film style isn't usually dictated in the script, like I'm saying to do here, but I absolutely would include it 
if I got to do a draft. Does that make me a bad hypothetical screenwriter? Maybe, but I think that including something like this in the script helps reinforce the writing a bit more. It's all in the theming, you know? But that's why this is the only visual element I'm going to bring up here. Do I think that they overplay the early blinking transitions? Yes. Do I feel that that fits in a script doctor format? To correct? Nope. All that said, I think we have covered everything here. Wait, Henry Cavill and John Cena should have kissed at the end. They're cowards for not including that. That's all for this one. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to do all that stuff. Like, subscribe, comment, and if you're able, become a channel member. Until next time, have a good one. Thank you.